Kurt Angle's biography aired this past weekend on A and E, Jim. Did you get a chance? It to did. Watch it? I, I did. I watched that, too. Uh, I'm trying to find right now my notes on on the self-same uh, aforesaid program. Yes, I did. Um, you know, I've got to admit that of all the biographies that they've done, this one would probably appeal most to not only a fan of biographies and documentaries just on anything, but also more to a non pro wrestling audience because of Kurt's story and all the weird, you know, things that he's been involved. I mean, you know, here's a guy who was an Olympic champion who was also involved peripherally in the DuPont and Dave Schultz Fox catcher fiasco was also a high level pro wrestler, but then can tell the story about his drug addiction. But then there's the the, the the sad sad story of his father dying a, in a construction accident and his sister overdosing later on i mean this could have been 3 hours kurtz had a lot of fucking life a lot of the other guys were like after 10 minutes can we get to where he starts wrestling but i actually like the non wrestling stuff more than the wrestling stuff i thought it was just such a compelling story it was well done i kind of hated when they got to wrestling i wanted to hear more yeah. about him with, you know, David Schultz and all that. I love yeah. it. Yeah, or D Dave Schultz. I guess we should... Or Dave Schultz. Well, for the, for our different wrestling audiences, not Dr. D, David Schultz, the pro wrestler, but Dave Schultz, the amateur wrestling great, who was the star of the Foxcatcher wrestling team that was funded by, what, John DuPont, who was the eccentric multimillionaire, one of the actual DuPonts, uh, who suddenly decided to fund, you know, the amateur wrestlers and give them everything they needed and a place to live so they could train and then ended up going fucking batshit crazy and shooting and killing his star wrestler for reasons that nobody's ever figured out, really. But I like the, all the early stuff. It's the first time they've ever made me care about a Sylvester Turkey feud. So I'll give him credit <laughs> for that. <laughs> By the way, by the way, it, it Bear, uh, Sylvester was nicknamed Bear, and you can see why. He looks more like a bear than a Sylvester. Uh, but I rematched that uh, 1992 NCAA final in OVW, I'll have you know. It wasn't as exciting as a work as it was as a shoot. But anyway, but yeah, they had so much story to tell here in this, and they started with his Hall of Fame induction, but then, you know, tease the dark times of addiction and then go back to his childhood growing up in Pittsburgh and, you know, his father being an alcoholic and then the horrible construction accident where he was actually brain dead and, you know, their mom had to make the decision to pull the plug. That's just, I never even knew that story. I'm surprised with the way things have happened. Thank goodness Kurt got in during the days when they didn't have to fucking talk about, expose all that stuff, or they've been doing angles off that probably. But it, it, the thing that stood out to me, the pictures, especially Kurt with hair and when he was young, and he's always had that thick neck. But Kurt Angle, until about six months after he got into professional wrestling, could you tell was the biggest straight laced just nerd a bland personality a very you know the typical you know jock athlete he's focused on that but nondescript as a personality he wasn't a public speaker he didn't he wasn't an overboard personality on all those clips where they interviewed him as a you know a college athlete or a high school athlete and he really he they explained he got into football to do something for his dad in his dad's name or memory and and then you know excelled at that and then got into wrestling in high school he never watched pro wrestling and his brothers didn't like it but he became the Pennsylvania state champ and then won the junior nationals and this is the and i've said a million times that people who were not fans of wrestling had a harder time getting it in their head, what it's supposed to be, what it's supposed to look like. What is the old saying? Kurt's the exception that proves the rule. Nobody else 
that I can think of that. And, and I mean, we just talked about this with Goldberg. He never watched wrestling, wasn't a fan of it. Well, he got over on, we they analyzed that whole show. He got over on personality and push and aggression and look, but nobody confused him with ever becoming a good worker. And part of the reason is he wasn't taught, but with Kurt, he had no idea of what this was going in and instantly was able to do the moves, which like we said, you can train a chimpanzee. And I don't think they made this distinction as, as well as they could have on the program. He could do the moves because he was a great athlete, but he picked up what the fuck he was doing and why he was doing it. And suddenly the personality comes out and I, you know, I was, I guess I'm jumping ahead. We'll go through a few more points in a second. I'll make this one and then I'll get back to it. But they didn't have any footage of him in Memphis for that six months. He was with Randy down in power pro. And that's when I moved back to Louisville. And obviously I was going down on weekends and working with Randy and I was managing Steve Bradley, who they had some footage of him and Kurt training at the warehouse and poor Steve never got the chance that he really should have. He was like, you know, uh, well, I'll go off on sad stories, but he was a great talent, potential talent. But Kurt was, he was still just Mr. You know, lollipop and baby face athlete and just plain bland. He was doing the moves, but he didn't at first understand anything about the personality. And they mentioned that he thought he was going to get cheered when he made his debut in the WWE after he'd been doing the I'm an Olympic hero, I'm an American hero, you know, promos. He'd been cheered in Memphis because he was booked as a babyface originally because he's from scratch and he's an Olympic gold medalist. So how are you going to make this guy's never done a promo, a heel when, you know, he's got those credentials. But as, as he got to the main roster and started seeing, I guess more of the, the big groups of fans and how they were reacting to the other guys, he got with it quicker than anybody I've ever seen. And yeah, they had him doing some silly things at the start, but once he got to where he could do his own shit and he had that cachet and he could take care of himself, you know, he was always on top and he was always figured in. And, you know, it just the, the, I wasn't surprised working with him when he'd had, he'd been in the business six weeks and then seeing him a year and a half later, I wasn't surprised that he, got the moves and the athleticism down, but the personality just oh, almost overnight, just boom, he got it. You tell the difference. Other than attitude, what was the big difference between him and Brock as students and as far as how they picked up wrestling? It's, well, it's, it's kind of like, you know, Brock had to go for the, he was such an athlete. He was doing the shooting star stuff and everything. And we'll get to that uh, later on. But Brock was was a, it was like the difference between Angle and Turkey in the 92 finals. Here's Turkey is 6'7 and 75 pounds bigger than Kurt, but Kurt just outmaneuvered him all over the fucking mat and just took him down at will and just the technique. Instead of a big guy who was using to, used to smothering people. <clears throat> it's kind of like, you know, Chris Taylor was in the Olympics as a wrestler, but does anybody think that Chris Taylor could just technically ability alone stretch Kurt Angle? No, it's a whole different can of peas. So Brock got by on size, power, aggression, animosity, physicality, but still Kurt was a whole nother level of just the wrestling. And, you know, that's where it, you, you definitely prove that size isn't everything. So I think, you know, Brock he wasn't as motivated to be the greatest pro wrestler in the world. Kurt Brock was motivated to be a great amateur wrestler. And then I thought that was what was so funny about the, uh, the thing when the rivals with, uh, he and Kurt is that a 2003 clip Brock said, 
oh, I, you know, I wanted to be God's gift to pro wrestling. He didn't. You could see he didn't really, he wasn't motivated to be the best in the world at that like he was amateur wrestling. Kurt, if he opened a dry cleaners, he would attempt to be the best dry cleaner in the fucking world. So it was, it was, it was different from the start. But they went into the Foxcatcher story on this biography, like I said, and at the same time, they they went into Kurt's ridiculous, driven, fanatical training methods. And that's why it was a boon to him to have, you know, a sponsor because he literally trained all day, every day to the exhaustion training. You know, as a result, he wins the, you know, the world championships in 95 in the freestyle championships and beat the German. And they had great footage of Kurt. I mean, he was just a fucking an alien from another planet on the mat with these guys, the amateur footage. Did you see that it's, it was a whole nother level of him and, and these other world-class guys that he's just taken out. You know, maybe they've shown it before, but I don't know if I've ever seen the footage of where he broke his neck before. You know, I, it, it hadn't been played as much as Mick coming off the top of the cell. I, I don't remember seeing that in that, detail at least uh ever either but um yeah they showed a slow-mo of him yeah breaking his neck i'd never seen that before i i don't think that i've seen it on any of the wwf packages now that you've mentioned it but yeah because and he explains that the guy was trying to it was like a shoot arm drag he was trying to take him over and if angles back hit the mat that's a fall so when he couldn't block himself with his hand he leaned his head back so that he wouldn't flip over like in wrestling you would go with it and take the bump safely and in amateur wrestling because you don't want your back to hit he leaned back and fucking took the bump on the top of his fucking head so that was the first of what five broken necks and then kurt even mentioned at one time when dupont was he put the guy over for all he did for him but he knew that he quote wasn't right and at one point, he thought Kurt Angle was in his walls. DuPont did. So at that point, and, and Angle had been like Dave Schultz's, you know, protege, and he looked at him as a mentor and a father figure. So DuPont shoots Schultz, and now Angle's devastated. And that's, what, six or seven months before the Olympics. And so... Schultz's wife starts a new group and Angle is the first wrestler asked to be in it and he breaks his neck again or breaks his neck rather taking uh, the the throw in the the trials and basically could have been knew he could have been paralyzed if he took a bump the wrong way so he got the doctors to numb his neck with Novocaine so that he could win the finals for the spot in the Olympics. And they even showed the guy, the guy knew that he was wrestling, that had that he had a, a bad neck or an injured neck, and he kept going to yank on the fucking neck to try to fuck Angle up. And he didn't know that Angle was Novocaine. So since the neck wasn't hurting, every time he went for the neck, Angle would fucking go for the guy's leg and take him down, score a point. So... Uh, but I mean, you can. I never realized Novocaine was used beyond tooth pain or tooth, uh, or I guess dental work, I should say. Well, it's not really supposed to be. I mean, it, it, yes, it has medical uses and it shouldn't be used that way. Because what, this is an old fucking trick of a number of professional athletes. What does your jaw feel like, especially if you've not just had one tooth worked on, but if you've had one of those, what do they call it? Some kind of, mandible block or something where they get right in the middle where your both sides of your jaw nerves connect if they got to do extensive shit point is you can't feel your fucking face it's like your face is not there right well that's what if a bad knee bad bad whatever if you novocaine that as long as it's structurally not broken i mean if you you know as long as your structure is intact then you can perform whatever your sport is without feeling any pain in that area. The problem is you also cannot feel if you do any more catastrophic damage to what you're doing. So Angle would theoretically, 
not felt any pain in his neck, if he'd have been thrown down the right way, he would have just lost all the feeling in the rest of his fucking body instantly. And he's going to the Olympics that way. So anyway, he blows through the early rounds of the Olympics. He finally gets the Iranian. He wins on the referee's decision. And that I've never seen that footage either. Have you ever seen that guy before? That Iranian oh, would have been a wrestling star. Yes, he he looked like an old time, like the fucking Yusef Hussein, the fucking, you know, terrible Turk. He could have been a wrestler in the 20s. But had you ever seen the footage of him crying and dedicating the win to his mother and all that stuff? Did they ever show that in the WWF? You know, again, I'm going to assume they've shown a lot of stuff and I just have not remembered it and hasn't been hammered into my head, but I felt like this thing was filled with footage I've never seen before. And specifically the amateur wrestling stuff, when he broke his neck the first time, I've never seen any of that stuff. Someone's going to say, oh, they showed it in 2001. I didn't see it. Well, th thanks for everybody for letting us know. Um, but anyway, so now he's, he's won the Olympics. That was his dream. And now he sits down and goes, well, now what? Because amateur wrestling ain't a great way to make money. And this story has been told numerous times. And, and I was there when they had the talks. I was working up there in the office at the time, but he turned down a 10 year deal. And I can't remember. It may have been the same thing. Mark Henry just got it a year before, right? Well, I was about to say, it may have been the same thing that they offered Mark or gave Mark 10 years at, at then 250 grand a year to start wrestling was unheard of, but Kurt turned it down because he felt like he was a true wrestler and his brothers had always knocked that phony wrestling. And so he said, okay, Vince, I'll take the deal. If I never, if you never asked me to lose a match because I should never lose. Cause I'm the Olympic champion. And Vince said, see you later. And I remember hearing that after the meeting they had, when it happened, I, you know, they said, well, we're not getting the Olympic guy. Was that before or after he went to the ECW arena? That was before. See here, I think it, somebody correct me if I'm wrong, or if you want to try to look this up, but he had talks with Vince and said he'd never wanted to lose a match. And Vince said, see ya. And then somehow, because Kurt was from Pittsburgh and they got him to come to Paulie, got him to come to the ECW arena and was going to attempt to do something based off Kurt Angle, Olympic wrestler, blah, blah, blah. And that's when, who'd they crucify that night? You're better with ECW than I am. A raven crucified the Sandman, from what I remember. Well, so, so Kurt, who's never been to a fucking pro wrestling show, I'm pretty sure at that point ever, live, goes to an ECW show at the ECW arena, and among the other, you know, wholesome family delights he sees is the crucifixion angle. And he's so offended that he storms out uh, of the building never to return there, right? I think that he had the talk with Vince. He was going to, this is something that legitimately he was interested in at least. He wanted to get into sports casting in Pittsburgh, local news sports casting, and thought that was something he was going to do at a, at a point in time. And that didn't pan out. And I think, you know, again, I don't know the particulars of how Paul Lee got him there that one night to ECW, but that happened. And then it was going into the better part of 1998. And finally, he was like, well, I need to call back and, you know, see about this big deal they made me. And he calls back and said that he said, and this is true, is that deal still available? And they told him, nope, but you can come and try out. You know, I, it wasn't like you can come and try out. It was more like you can come to the warehouse to these training camps that we're having. And see, you know, because now he's backed up on it once to see if you want to pursue this. And then, yes, we will offer you a contract, but it's not going to be for, you know, 10 years or for that much guaranteed money or whatever. That was basically, as I recall, the the presentation that was made to Kurt. But Can I ask you a question about that? Yes, yes. A, would you have done it the same way 
And B, was that a reflection on Kurt not taking the deal originally? Or by that point in time, Mark Henry had not impressed too many within his first couple of years within the company. Were they regretting that deal and it would have affected another 10-year deal like the Kurt Angle one? Probably both, one from column A and one from column B. Um, it, Mark's not panning out over the first couple of years didn't, I'm sure, endear them to the idea of signing any more Olympic athletes to 10-year contracts. But primarily it was, again, everybody now out there listening is thinking, Kurt Angle, they were giving Kurt Angle the runaround? No, it wasn't Kurt Angle. It was a guy named Kurt Angle that was the Olympic gold medalist in wrestling, but there had been many of those throughout the history of the Olympics. And not all or even most of them wanted to make the transition to pro wrestling or ended up doing it successfully. And so this is a, he was a commodity with a ton of potential that could be marketed in the WWF, but if he didn't want to do it or he, they didn't know Kurt at that point. They didn't know about his determination. They didn't know about his ridiculous obsession with being the best at everything. They, you know, so what I'm saying is when they're, when their first meeting with a guy is, yes, I just won the Olympic gold medal. So I'll, I've never even seen your shows, but I'll take your two or $3 million over the next 10 years. Uh, as long as you never ask me to lose. So that's the interaction they've had with Kurt Angle. So, and they figured all, and I remember, I think Jim Ross, hopefully won't mind me stooging, but JR had said at one point, well, in, in JR's inimitable style, that boy will call back when he figures out that it's not going to be all smooth sailing, you know, as an amateur trying to make money or as a, you know. The other thing is, who was he around his whole athletic life as a wrestler? You know, wrestlers... Amateur wrestlers didn't think highly of professional wrestling. I remember even like in the 80s, Jeff Blatnick used to challenge Hulk Hogan. Not like in a, yeah. I'm going to kill you. Like, no, if this guy thinks he's tough, he should wrestle me. I'm an Olympic wrestler. Wrestle me. So there was yes. always, especially with the popularity in the 80s on a mainstream level, there were always a lot of resentments from actual wrestlers towards wrestling. And that's the thing is, and you, you know, you can see both sides. You can see the the legitimate amateurs going, well, those guys, some of them, yes, don't know how to wrestle. Some of them do and might even be better than you. But the professionals were making a ton of money, getting all the women, making, you know, all the national TV shows, and the amateur wrestlers are, you know, bleh. And so they were resentful. And then on the other side, the pros would say, well, yeah, you may be able to stretch me, but you can't buy me because I make 10 times the money you make. So who's a fucking star here anyway? But when, when Kurt came to the warehouse and started training with Dr. Tom and Dory Funk Jr., then he applied himself. And then you could see, okay, now we've got something because this guy is a freak athlete. And But he struggled on promos, as they showed, a, a few things where he was you know, blowing stuff or whatever. It, and that was the same thing. Like I said, they skipped over. He was in Memphis from, I'm I'm pretty sure, probably March or April through October, November. And uh, again, you could already tell he was better in the ring. And Steve Bradley was a big help to him in, in kind of leading him because Steve had experience at that point, obviously more than Kurt. But the promos were just, it was dull, and his personality was dull, and he was just sitting there still kind of wide-eyed, like trying to take the whole thing in. But very quickly, you know, he gets the main roster, he starts getting the feedback from the fans, and his personality turned on. And, you know, it, he always had physical charisma. You could see in the footage of the amateur wrestling meets, when he would win, he would jump up, the arms in the air, he'd run, he'd express it on his face. His body language, his physical charisma was always there, but the personality, it took pro wrestling. And then, boom, that comes on. And um, so within a year, he wins the WWF title. And he was a, you know, a prodigy at that point. And when you see the early to mid 2000s action highlights, holy shit, again, 
it's not only the modern talent, it's the modern presentation. I know I'm not blaming all the boys, but God damn, this is a whole different fucking thing. This almost looks like compared to the shit we're seeing now, this shit looks like it's the UFC. Fuck. They're beating the shit out of each other. And of course that led to Kurt's addiction issues. Uh, because then he went over the the various injuries he had, but he broke his neck three more times in what, like the next two or three years. That was crazy when they had it was almost like a montage. And then I did this yeah. and I broke my neck. And then I trained real hard. I came back. I went to the back to the ring and I broke my neck. And I went to back to the same doctor. It just kept happening. It was crazy. Uh, and see, a lot of people are oh, bullshit because they thought broken neck like in the movies. You know, Bella Lugosi is fucking Igor with the crack in his neck. Buster Keaton had a broken neck. Um, yes, yeah, you know, when it, it's technically you're breaking your neck when you break vertebrae. And he had numerous of them. And I remember the first time, and he talked about that Dr. Joe, I think. Uh, Joe. He, no, I think it was J-H-O. Oh, okay. I'm thinking Joe, of I think. Because he was, he was, he didn't have the neck fusion that Austin and some of the other guys had. He wanted to do a minimally invasive procedure, so he'd only be out a couple months, and that's the first one he had. And he was out, you know, six weeks, came back and broke it again, and then he had the same thing redone. And then with Eddie Guerrero, WrestleMania 2004, he does it a third time. So then he takes time off. And come, I think he broke it back again later on. But by that time, obviously there was a painkiller presence issue in his life. And, and, you know, I was thinking this is one of the saddest. And Kurt is so honest and tells it so well and is just so well-spoken. And The Rock does a great job on these things also. But, you know, then Kurt's sister gets on drugs and he's sending her money and she's using it for drugs. And they have a, you know, problematic relationship. And then she ODs after they hadn't spoken to each other in eight months. And he's up to taking 60 something pills a day. And finally, Vince tells him, and this was pretty widely known at the time also uh, go to rehab or leave. And the, the comment was, an Olympic gold medalist is not going to die in the WWE on my watch. And so he left and went to TNA. And I remember, you know, when, when they announced he was coming in, I was there and I was like, Mike, this is going to be a big fucking boost for us in the ring and star power wise, but how's his health? You know, that's the, so, and then he says, Kurt says, he started drinking. Because remember, this was a guy that was a, the fucking most elite level athlete in the world. He never took drugs for fun. He didn't drink. His father was an alcoholic. And suddenly now he's taking enough pain pills and various medications to kill a horse and drinking on top of it so it'll kick in better. And, you know, but, but the, the TNA run... <laughs> What was that, 30 seconds? Jim Ross said, well, he's lucky he's not dead after that debacle of a run in TNA. And he was there, what, eight fucking years or six years or whatever, and they covered it in 30 seconds. Of course, this is a WWE-sponsored program. He had, he, honestly, they didn't deserve him. He still had great matches down there, and I've, I've mentioned I'd be the producer for some of his matches. And, you know, I would try sometimes in the production meeting, if there was some ridiculous, you know, stuntman stuff going to be going on, can we not simplify this a little bit in Kurt's case? Because you know how, what shape he's going to be in afterwards, after every pay-per-view match, and sometimes after a big TV match, if it was a single match or something that he was relied on to produce, I would go back to check on him afterwards because I'm the producer, I'm checking on the talent, and he's laying in the floor there at uh, Universal with one of those, one of those um, 
rooms past the production office. Well, this makes no sense to anybody who hadn't been there. So he's laying in one of the rooms with an uh, laying on an ice pack on his neck. He's on his back. He's got an ice pack taped to his thigh because maybe there's a hamstring problem. And he's got another ice pack on some part of his back. And he's laying there and, you know, every once in a while, the, the, the masseuse would be there going, squeeze my hand. And he'd go, I am. <laughs> you know, I'm like, what the fuck? How can this guy do this? It, that he goes out and you wouldn't think anything was wrong with him. And he has these performances and he comes back and his whole body is caked in ice and quivering. So at that point, they didn't, they, they glossed over the situation with Karen. He mentioned his first wife had left him and took the kids. But by that point, that's where he started getting the DUIs. He's drinking and driving on top of pills. He got four DUIs in five years, and those were reported. One of them was, one or more of them was right near his house in Pittsburgh where he's a local celebrity. So his new wife finally threatened to leave him unless he went to rehab, and and that's what, you know, turned the, the deal around for him. And now, you know, it's, it's great. Uh, the the 2017 uh, Hall of Fame, I was there. So I've, that's the last time I saw Kurt in person. But they had the footage of him coming in and hugging Vince in his office and then Vince kicking the camera out because he was showing human emotion. And now apparently, you know, he's happy with his younger kids, his kids with his new wife, and he's clean, I'm assuming. And as far as we know, he says he is. We don't have a reason to doubt him. And there was the big deal over. He still has pain, and he's still going to have to have more surgeries, but now he can't take pain pills. So that's kind of another cautionary tale to any wrestlers for all the other reasons don't get problems with these things but if you get problems with these things and you kick it you've kicked it for now but in 10 years or 15 years or however long it is till your fucking body says fuck you for all the things you did to it when it was 25 years old you're gonna have to have surgeries and then you're going to have to have surgeries without pain medication. And something to look forward to. Sort of like dental, dental work without Novocaine. So maybe that's another reason to think about that. But this was an amazing show, I thought. And, you know, they didn't try to sugarcoat Kurt's life. They glossed over the, his time with the competitor, but that was pretty much the only major remission. Can you find anything wrong with it? Certainly you can You can find something wrong with anything. Well, there were things that you said omission. They didn't mention the ECW thing, which is kind of a legendary story. They didn't mention any of the training with Memphis or anything. The thing I thought was really interesting was when they talked about TNA, they had Steve Austin, who mentioned that he saw Kurt in TNA, and he just, I forget the exact comment, but it was something about like what a step down it was. And then they showed a clip, I think, of him against Samoa Joe which is probably the best thing he ever did in TNA. Yeah, yeah. But you look at it and you're like, you know what? Look-wise, it does look like a big step down. And when you see a guy like that, a star like Kurt Angle, on the biggest show, it's more noticeable the drop from the biggest show to the second show when you take that character, that yeah. person from the first show, and put him on the second show. And, you know, I, that's the thing is that as much as we, I was working for TNA at the time and we were all pulling for success, but Kurt going from the WWE with their level of ratings and pay-per-view buys and house show business at that time and going to TNA and their level of same, it was literally, he was automatically in front of a 10th as many people. The, we were doing over a million people million and a half at best on Spike at that point, and they were doing, what, still four or five million people on their Raw or SmackDown, but the pay-per-view business was 10 to 1. As I think Kurt and 
Joe, I heard, did 50,000 buys for the first match, which was the biggest pay-per-view that TNA ever did because, well, we won't even go off on a tangent, but Shitstain's booking style specifically hindered pay-per-view buys because it was all about crash TV and what's going to go on on the television program and no match building or, you know, big show peaking. So, but the pay-per-views, it was 10 to 1 difference. So that's why a lot of times, even when, and that's, again, why I try to explain to the fans of any promotion, get a fucking grip on reality, because guys would leave the WWF in 2006, 7, 8, go to work for TNA, who was doing ratings of a million or a million and a half people on Spike, and they would, people would see him in the airport and go, why aren't you still wrestling? And yeah, for the people who like that kind of thing, that's the kind of thing those people like. But whether it's TNA, AEW, whatever, whatever. Yeah, remember the reactions to Jericho and the NBA fans saw him beyond like any of the issues yes. about the way he looked? It was like, I haven't seen him. This is what he's doing. He's wrestling for this bootleg WWE. That was the understanding from the average non-wrestling fan. And for the average ex-wrestling fan. Because they're not non-wrestling fans. They knew who Jericho was, and they used to watch him. They just don't anymore. But anyway, there, therein you have the... And, and I wouldn't say the ECW... Come on, hold on there, cowboy, with the legendary story. It was legendary amongst the business and the smart fans. But for an AEW... AEW for oh, an A&E... It documentary it would have been great look i understand why they it would have been great footage but you know it forget didn't about the footage the piece. show no footage just have him talk about it and then have paul talk about it and intersplice those clips <laughs> that's all you need you don't have to show i understand why they don't want to show the sandman being crucified on a and e while his son i think was standing there and his wife I, it's a mess but other than that i i thought it was a yeah. great documentary Anyway, therein you have it there. Biography on, and next week is Lex Luger. And from the tease, just the 30-second commercial, I think I'm going to be halfway interested in this one. Because we've talked about Lex has made a transformation in his personal life, uh, unfortunately, after his health issues, but to where he's maybe the nicest, happiest, most contented, whatever, now that he's ever been, but he had a lot of bumps in the road along the way, so we'll look forward to that. At least we don't have to worry about the uh, the Bella Twins Part 2. It is interesting. I know you didn't watch the Bella Twins documentary, but I thought about it when we were talking about the neck before. Nikki Bella had a finishing move called the Rack Attack, which was a torture rack where she would drop to her knees and the person would fall off behind her. And they had a montage of that in the Bella documentary. She said, what I didn't know was every yeah. time I did that, I was breaking my neck. And that's why she broke her neck, was that move that she did yeah. night after night. Well, because all that weight coming down on your neck. But besides, if, she, if rack attack, seems like she should have grabbed somebody and smothered them with her bosoms. I think that's what they did with the pun of the name, was a hypothetical smothering of the bosoms with the name. You you would just grab the guy or the girl by the back of their hair, bring them close to you, and smother them inside your bosoms. I don't know if that would happen, but Jim, you know what that means. Are we closed? We have a new sponsor here this week. Oh, a new sponsor. A very new sponsor, and we're happy to have them on board, and we know they're happy to be here, but we want to let the listeners know all about our friends with prize picks. Prize picks and... I understand from you, Brian, there's a way to make money on this. Of course. Now, Jim, this is not a script. I want to put this into my own words. Tonight, I'm taking Patrick Mahomes to throw more than 320 passing yards, Derrick Henry to rush less than 85 yards, and Cooper Cup to score more than .5 touchdowns, and Tyreek Hill to catch less than 3.5 passes. All the more amazing because I don't think football season started yet. But, Jim... Those are my thoughts. What are yours? Wait a minute. What the hell? Now, with the folks at Prize Picks, they're our new sponsor. Yes. And you said the, 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 the fans, the members of the Cult of Cornette, the listeners, they can play games and make money by doing Prize Picks. Did I say that? But, 
That's well. That's that's what we said uh, uh, when I first heard about this. But then I got I got some of the promotional information, and it it requires a knowledge of professional sports of other kind besides wrestling that I don't necessarily possess, and it also requires some knowledge of fantasy sports entries and projections and things i'm not familiar with all the verbiage so can you explain this to me and to the people i know you just gave the sample that's but right. i don't know who all those people are well of course we want to remind everyone prize picks has an app and you go to prizepicks.com as well but jim let me ask you what do you love about their games and format is it easy to play i don't know what current entries do you have what is an entry how much have you won what what am I entering? I haven't started playing yet. That's what I'm asking you. But it, you'd be winning if you just you, started playing. You, just start playing and winning. But how do you play? Come on, just play. You go to you go to prizepicks.com. That's that's prize like prize p r i z e and picks p i c k s. prizepicks.com and you sign up and you play the daily fantasy sports, right? Or the app. That's they what you app. do. They have, a very they have an app. app. What's yes. an app? How do you use an app? Now, you don't have a smartphone for any of the new listeners wondering why you would ask this question. And Can I get an it. app on my computer? Actually, you can, depending on the well, computer you have. It's got a dot .com here. That's what I usually use the computer for is the stuff with the dot .com. Right. The dot .com so, is the actual website. That's the location yeah. you can go to on your computer. Let's say you had a smartphone and you just wanted to go to prize picks and just start playing games right away. You would go to your home screen on your computer and find the little icon for prize picks, and you'd click that, and it would take you there. Not needing to go to a website, going directly to them. That's the app. Well, how does the little prize picks thing get on the screen for prizepicks.com? Does well, somebody put it there? Do well, they infiltrate your computer? <laughs> you would download it from wherever you get your apps. If you were on an Apple I've device, never gotten would... an app. You would ask your caretaker to use your smartphone and find a place where they have apps. And All right, well, let's back up. We're going to win some money here. And I understand from the people at Prize Picks that first-time users can receive a 100% instant deposit match up to $100 with the promo code JC. So that no. means now I, I can figure this JCE. JCE. Let's get the That's promo code. That's what I just code, said. Right? J promo code JCE. I just, I just did JCE. <laughs> That's what I did there. I elongated that CE. But now, so I understand that if you deposit $100, then they give you another $100. If you deposit $50, they give you another $50. They're giving you all this money. And then you do what with it? You, 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 they've got the daily fantasy stuff that all the other sports people do, but you can... You can win up to multiple times your money. I think it says you can win up to 10 times your money on any of the entries in these things. Well, of course, Jim, it's very easy to understand. You could pick two to five players, and if they will go score more or less than their prize pick projection, prize picks projection, you can win up to 10 times your money on any entry. And there's no competing That's against other people. It's just you versus the projections. <laughs> That's That's easy. It's easy to understand they offer projections on any sport, NFL, NBA, MLB, NHL, PGA, college football, men's college football, basketball, women's college, ba do they have women's college football, women's college basketball, soccer, WNBA, eSports, NASCAR, tennis, MMA, boxing, disc golf, <laughs> Euro basketball, cricket. <laughs> If One of you, these things is not like the others, ladies and gentlemen. If you have a sudden compulsion to bet on disc golf, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> now, wait a minute. You, you, you're not, you, these are not bets. They're entries. They're entries. And, of course, entries can be made in 60 seconds or less. I wouldn't really even need 60 seconds to make this entry. <laughs> And you can make safe and fast withdrawals from where of what we're not sure, but this is currently operational in over 30 states and Canada. So apparently they're following the uh, marijuana legalization. Uh, but right now, what you need to do 
after we've explained this so clearly and concisely, if you have any questions, you need to download that Prize Picks app wherever the apps come <laughs> from, or go to prizepicks.com and you can sign up and play the daily fantasy sports. And first time users, 100% instant deposit match up to $100 with the promo code JCE, not JCE. And if you deposit $100, Prize Picks gives you $100. If you deposit $50, they'll give you $50. We got to figure out some way to work this system where you deposit 50, they give you 100, but I'm not sure right now. We're still, they're a new sponsor, folks. It'll take us a couple of weeks to figure out how to screw them. But don't forget to enter the promo code JCE at your sign up for an instant deposit match of up to $100 and then go crazy on the sports. You'll make some money. You can win up to 10 times your money on any entry. But some plates do go down in value, so we're not guaranteeing anything. 